Section 57 of Commentary on the Epistles of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentary on the Epistles of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians, Volume 1, by John Calvin. Translated by Rev. John Pringle. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 28 to 31. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. He has in the beginning of the chapter spoken of gifts. Now he begins to treat of offices, and this order it is proper that we should carefully observe. For the Lord did not appoint ministers without first endowing them with the requisite gifts, and qualifying them for discharging their duty. Hence we must infer that those are fanatics and actuated by an evil spirit, who intrude themselves into the church, while destitute of the necessary qualifications, as many boast that they are under the influence of the spirit, and glory in a secret call from God, while in the meantime they are unlearned and utterly ignorant. The natural order, on the other hand, is this, that gifts come before the office to be discharged. As then he has taught above, that everything that an individual has received from God should be made subservient to the common good, so now he declares that offices are distributed in such a manner that all may together, as united efforts, edify the church, and each individual according to his measure. 28. First Apostles. He does not enumerate all the particular kinds, and there was no need of this, for he merely intended to bring forward some examples. In the fourth chapter of the Epistle to the Ephesians, verse 11, there is a fuller enumeration of the offices that are required for the continued government of the church. The reason of this I shall assign there, if the Lord shall permit me to advance so far, though even there he does not make mention of them all. As to the passage before us, we must observe that of the offices which Paul makes mention of, some are perpetual, others temporary. Those that are perpetual are such as are necessary for the government of the church. Those that are temporary are such as were appointed at the beginning for the founding of the church and the raising up of Christ's kingdom, and these in a short time afterwards ceased. To the first class belongs the office of teacher, to the second the office of apostle. For the Lord created the apostles, that they might spread the gospel throughout the whole world, and he did not assign to each of them certain limits or parishes, but would have them, wherever they went, to discharge the office of ambassadors among all nations and languages. In this respect there is a difference between them and pastors, who are in a manner tied to their particular churches. For the pastor has not a commission to preach the gospel over the whole world, but to take charge of the church that has been committed to his charge. In his epistle to the Ephesians, he places evangelists after the apostles, but here he passes them over, for from the highest order he passes immediately to prophets. By this term he means, in my opinion, not those who are endowed with the spirit of prophesying, but those who are endowed with a peculiar gift, not merely for interpreting scripture, but also for applying it wisely for present use. My reason for thinking so is this, that he prefers prophecy to all other gifts, on the ground of its yielding more edification, a commendation that would not be applicable to the predicting of future events. Farther, when he describes the office of prophet, or at least treats of what he ought principally to do, he says that he must devote himself to consolation, exhortation, and doctrine. Now these are things that are distinct from prophesyings. Let us then, by prophets in this passage, understand, first of all, eminent interpreters of Scripture, 
and farther persons who are endowed with no common wisdom and dexterity in taking a right view of the present necessity of the church that they may speak suitably to it and in this way be in a manner ambassadors to communicate the divine will between them and teachers this difference may be pointed out that the office of teacher consists in taking care that sound doctrines be maintained and propagated in order that the purity of religion may be kept up in the church at the same time even this term is taken in different senses and here perhaps it is used rather in the sense of pastor unless you prefer it may be to take it in a general way for all that are endowed with the gift of teaching as in acts thirteen one where also luke conjoins them with prophets my reason for not agreeing with those who make the whole of the office of prophet consist in the interpretation of scripture is this that paul restricts the number of those who ought to speak to two or three first corinthians fourteen twenty nine which would not accord with a bare interpretation of scripture in fine my opinion is this that the prophets here spoken of are those who make known the will of god by applying with dexterity and skill prophecies threatenings promises and the whole doctrine of scripture to the present use of the church if any one is of a different opinion i have no objection to his being so and will not raise any quarrel on that account for it is difficult to form a judgment as to gifts and offices of which the church has been so long deprived excepting only that there are some traces or shadows of them still to be seen as to powers and gift of healings i have spoken when commenting on the twelfth chapter of the romans only it must be observed that here he makes mention not so much of the gifts themselves as of the administration of them as the apostle is here enumerating offices i do not approve of what chrysostom says that antilepses that is helps or aids consist in supporting the weak what is it then undoubtedly it is either an office as well as gift that was exercised in ancient times but of which we have at this day no knowledge whatever or it is connected with the office of deacon or in other words the care of the poor and this latter idea pleases me better in romans twelve seven he makes mention of two kinds of deacons of these i have treated when commenting upon that passage by governments i understand elders who had the charge of discipline for the primitive church had its senate for the purpose of keeping the people in propriety of deportment as paul shows elsewhere when he makes mention of two kinds of presbyters first timothy five seventeen hence government consisted of those presbyters who excelled others in gravity experience and authority under different kinds of tongues he comprehends both the knowledge of languages and the gift of interpretation they are however two distinct gifts because in some cases an individual spoke in different languages and yet did not understand the language of the church with which he had to do this defect was supplied by interpreters twenty nine are all apostles it may indeed have happened that one individual was endowed with many gifts and sustained two of the offices which he has enumerated nor was there in this any inconsistency paul's object however is to show in the first place that no one has such a fullness in everything as to have a sufficiency within himself and not require the aid of others and secondly that offices as well as gifts are distributed in such a manner that no one member constitutes the whole body but each contributing his portion to the common advantage they then altogether constitute an entire and perfect body for paul means here to take away every occasion of proud boasting base envyings haughtiness and contempt of the brethren malignity ambition and everything of that nature thirty one seek after the more excellent gifts it might also be rendered value highly and it would not suit ill with the passage though it makes little difference as to the meaning for paul exhorts the corinthians to esteem and desire those gifts especially which are most conducive to edification for this fault prevailed among them that they aimed at show rather than usefulness hence prophecy was neglected while languages sounded forth among them with great show indeed but with little profit 
he does not however address individuals as though he wished that every one should aspire at prophecy or the office of teacher but simply recommends to them a desire to promote edification that they may apply themselves the more diligently to those things that are most conducive to edification. End of section 57